The election of President and Vice President of the United States is an indirect election in which citizens of the United States who are registered to vote in one of the 50 U.S. states or in Washington, D.C. cast ballots not directly for those offices, but instead for members of the U.S. Electoral College, known as electors. These electors then in turn cast direct votes, known as electoral votes, for President, and for Vice President. The candidate who receives an absolute majority of electoral votes at least 270 out of a total of 538, since the 23rd Amendment granting voting rights to citizens of Washington, D.C. is then elected to that office. If no candidate receives an absolute majority of the votes for president, the House of Representatives chooses the winner. If no one receives an absolute majority of the votes for vice president, then the Senate chooses the winner. The Electoral College and its procedure are established in the U.S. Constitution by Article 2, Section 1, Clauses 2 and 4, and the Twelfth Amendment which replaced Clause 3 after its ratification in 1804. Under Clause 2, each of the states casts as many electoral votes as the total number of its senators and representatives in Congress, while, per the 23rd Amendment ratified in 1961, Washington, D.C. casts the same number of electoral votes as the least represented state, which is 3. Also under Clause 2, the manner for choosing electors is determined by each state legislature, not directly by the federal government. Many state legislatures previously selected their electors directly, but over time all of them switched to using the popular vote to help determine electors, which persists today. Once chosen, electors generally cast their electoral votes for the candidate who won the plurality in their state, but at least 21 states do not have provisions that specifically address this behavior. Those who vote in opposition to the plurality are known as faithless or unpledged electors. In modern times, faithless and unpledged electors have not affected the ultimate outcome of an election, so the results can generally be determined based on the state by state popular vote. Presidential elections occur quadrennially with registered voters casting their ballots on Election Day, which since 1845 has been the first Tuesday after November 1. This date coincides with the general elections of various other federal, state, and local races. Since local governments are responsible for managing elections, these races typically all appear on one ballot. The Electoral College electors then formally cast their electoral votes on the first Monday after December 12 at their respective state capitals. Congress then certifies the results in early January, and the presidential term begins on Inauguration Day, which since the passage of the 20th Amendment has been set at January 20. The nomination process, consisting of the primary elections and caucuses and the nominating conventions, was not specified in the Constitution, but was developed over time by the states and political parties. These primary elections are generally held between January and June before the general election in November, while the nominating conventions are held in the summer. Though not codified by law, political parties also follow an indirect election process, where voters in the 50 U.S. states, Washington, D.C., and U.S. territories, cast ballots for a slate of delegates to a political party's nominating convention, who then in turn elect their party's presidential nominee. Each party may then choose a vice presidential running mate to join the ticket, which is either determined by choice of the nominee or by a second round of voting. Because of changes to national campaign finance laws since the 1970s regarding the disclosure of contributions for federal campaigns, presidential candidates from the major political parties usually declare their intentions to run as early as the spring of the previous calendar year before the election almost 18 months before Inauguration Day. History Article II of the United States Constitution originally established the method of presidential elections, including the Electoral College. This was a result of a compromise between those constitutional framers who wanted the Congress to choose the president, and those who preferred a national popular vote. Each state is allocated a number of electors that is equal to the size of its delegation in both houses of Congress combined. With the ratification of the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution in 1961, the District of Columbia is also granted a number of electors, equal to the number of those held by the least populous state. However, U.S. territories are not represented in the Electoral College. Constitutionally, the manner for choosing electors is determined within each state by its legislature. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 states that each state shall appoint electors in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct." 
During the first presidential election in 1789, only six of the thirteen original states chose electors by any form of popular vote. Gradually throughout the years, the states began conducting popular elections to choose their slate of electors. In 1800, only five of the sixteen states chose electors by a popular vote. By 1824, after the rise of Jacksonian democracy, the proportion of states that chose electors by popular vote had sharply risen to 18 out of 24 states. This gradual movement toward greater democratization coincided with a gradual decrease in property restrictions for the franchise. By 1840, only one of the 26 states South Carolina still selected electors by the state legislature. Under the original system established by Article II, electors could cast two votes to two different candidates for president. The candidate with the highest number of votes provided it was a majority of the electoral votes became the president, and the second-place candidate became the vice president. This presented a problem during the presidential election of 1800 when Aaron Burr received the same number of electoral votes as Thomas Jefferson and challenged Jefferson's election to the office. In the end, Jefferson was chosen as the president because of Alexander Hamilton's influence in the House of Representatives. In response to the 1800 election, the Twelfth Amendment was passed, requiring electors to cast two distinct votes, one for president and another for vice president. While this solved the problem at hand, it ultimately had the effect of lowering the prestige of the vice presidency, as the office was no longer for the leading challenger for the presidency. The separate ballots for president and vice president became something of a moot issue later in the 19th century when it became the norm for popular elections to determine a state's electoral college delegation. Electors chosen this way are pledged to vote for a particular presidential and vice presidential candidate offered by the same political party. So, while the Constitution says that the president and vice president are chosen separately, in practice they are chosen together. The Twelfth Amendment also established rules when no candidate wins a majority vote in the Electoral College. In the presidential election of 1824, Andrew Jackson received a plurality, but not a majority, of electoral votes cast. The election was thrown to the House of Representatives, and John Quincy Adams was elected to the presidency. A deep rivalry resulted between Andrew Jackson and House Speaker Henry Clay, who had also been a candidate in the election. Since 1824, aside from the occasional, faithless elector, the popular vote determines the winner of a presidential election by determining the electoral vote, as each state or district's popular vote determines its electoral college vote. Although the nationwide popular vote does not directly determine the winner of a presidential election, it does strongly correlate with who is the victor. In 53 of the 58 total elections held so far about 91%, the winner of the national popular vote has also carried the electoral college vote. The winners of the nationwide popular vote and the electoral college vote differ only in close elections. In highly competitive elections, candidates focus on turning out their vote in the contested swing states critical to winning an electoral college majority, so they do not try to maximize their popular vote by real or fraudulent vote increases in one-party areas. However, candidates can fail to get the most votes in the nationwide popular vote in a presidential election and still win that election. In the 1824 election, Jackson won the popular vote, but no one received the majority of electoral votes. According to the Twelfth Amendment in the Constitution, the House of Representatives must choose the president out of the top three people in the election. Clay had come forth, so he threw his support to Adams, who then won. Because Adams later named Clay his Secretary of State, Jackson's supporters claimed that Adams gained the presidency by making a deal with Clay. Charges of a corrupt bargain followed Adams through his term. Then in 1876, 1888, 2000, and 2016, the winner of electoral vote lost the popular vote outright. Numerous constitutional amendments have been submitted seeking to replace the electoral college with a direct popular vote, but none has ever successfully passed both houses of Congress. Another alternate proposal is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, an interstate compact whereby individual participating states agree to allocate their electors based on the winner of the national popular vote instead of just their respective statewide results. The presidential election day was established on a Tuesday in the month of November because of the factors involved weather, harvests and worship. When voters used to travel to the polls by horse, Tuesday was an ideal day because it allowed people to worship on Sunday, ride to their county seat on Monday, and vote on Tuesday all before market day, Wednesday. 
The month of November also fits nicely between harvest time and harsh winter weather, which could be especially bad to people traveling by horse and buggy. Until 1937, presidents were not sworn in until March 4 because it took so long to count and report ballots, and because of the winner's logistical issues of moving to the capital. With better technology and the 20th Amendment being passed, presidential inaugurations were moved to noon on January 20 allowing presidents to start their duties sooner. The Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 was enacted to increase disclosure of contributions for federal campaigns. Subsequent amendments to law require that candidates to a federal office must file a statement of candidacy with the Federal Election Commission before they can receive contributions aggregating in excess of $5,000 or make expenditures aggregating in excess of $5,000. Thus, this began a trend of presidential candidates declaring their intentions to run as early as the spring of the previous calendar year so they can start raising and spending the money needed for their nationwide campaign. The first president, George Washington, was elected as an independent. Since the election of his successor, John Adams, in 1796, all winners of U.S. presidential elections have represented one of two major parties. Third parties have taken second place only twice, in 1860 and 1912. The last time a third independent candidate achieved significant success although still finishing in third place was in 1992, and the last time a third-party candidate received any electoral votes not from faithless electors was in 1968. Procedure Eligibility requirements Article 2 of the United States Constitution stipulates that for a person to serve as president, the individual must be a natural-born citizen of the United States, at least 35 years old, and a resident of the United States for a period of no less than 14 years. A candidate may start running his or her campaign early before turning 35 years old or completing 14 years of residency, but must meet the age and residency requirements by Inauguration Day. The 22nd Amendment to the Constitution also sets a term limit, a president cannot be elected to more than two terms. The U.S. Constitution also has two provisions that apply to all federal offices in general, not just the presidency. Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7 states that if the U.S. Congress convicts any officer on impeachment, they may also bar that person from holding any public office in the future. And Section 3 of the 14th Amendment prohibits the election to any federal office of any person who had held any federal or state office and then engaged in insurrection, rebellion or treason. This disqualification can be waived if such an individual gains the consent of two-thirds of both houses of Congress. In addition, the 12th Amendment establishes that the vice president must meet all of the qualifications of being a president. Although not a mandatory requirement, federal campaign finance laws including the Federal Election Campaign Act state that a candidate who intends to receive contributions aggregating in excess of $5,000 or make expenditures aggregating in excess of $5,000, among others, must first file a statement of candidacy with the Federal Election Commission. This has led presidential candidates, especially members from the two major political parties, to officially announce their intentions to run as early as the spring of the previous calendar year so they can start raising or spending the money needed for their nationwide campaign. Potential candidates usually form exploratory committees even earlier to determining the feasibility of them actually running. Topic. Nominating process The modern nominating process of U.S. presidential elections consists of two major parts, a series of presidential primary elections and caucuses held in each state, and the presidential nominating conventions held by each political party. This process was never included in the United States Constitution, and thus evolved over time by the political parties to clear the field of candidates. The primary elections are run by state and local governments, while the caucuses are organized directly by the political parties. Some states hold only primary elections, some hold only caucuses, and others use a combination of both. These primaries and caucuses are staggered generally between January and June before the federal election, with Iowa and New Hampshire traditionally holding the first presidential state caucus and primary, respectively. Like the general election, presidential caucuses or primaries are indirect elections. 
The major political parties officially vote for their presidential candidate at their respective nominating conventions, usually all held in the summer before the federal election. Depending on each state's law and state's political party rules, when voters cast ballots for a candidate in a presidential caucus or primary, they may be voting to award delegates bound to vote for a candidate at the presidential nominating conventions, or they may simply be expressing an opinion that the state party is not bound to follow in selecting delegates to their respective national convention. Unlike the general election, voters in the U.S. territories can also elect delegates to the national conventions. Furthermore, each political party can determine how many delegates to allocate to each state and territory. In 2012 for example, the Democratic and Republican Party conventions each used two different formulas to allocate delegates. The Democrats based theirs on two main factors, the proportion of votes each state gave to the Democratic candidate in the previous three presidential elections, and the number of electoral votes each state had in the Electoral College. In contrast, the Republicans assigned to each state 10 delegates, plus three delegates per congressional district. Both parties then gave fixed amounts of delegates to each territory, and finally bonus delegates to states and territories that passed certain criteria, along with delegates chosen during primaries and caucuses, state and U.S. territory delegations to both the Democratic and Republican Party conventions also include unpledged delegates that have a vote. For Republicans, they consist of the three top party officials from each state and territory. Democrats have a more expansive group of unpledged delegates called superdelegates, who are party leaders and elected officials. Each party's presidential candidate also chooses a vice presidential nominee to run with him or her on the same ticket, and this choice is rubber stamped by the convention. If no single candidate has secured a majority of delegates, including both pledged and unpledged, then a brokered convention results all pledged delegates are then released and are able to switch their allegiance to a different candidate thereafter the nomination is decided through a process of alternating political horse trading and additional rounds of re-votes the conventions have historically been held inside convention centers but since the late 20th century both the democratic and republican parties have favored sports arenas and domed stadiums to accommodate the increasing attendance Topic. The popular vote on Election Day Under the United States Constitution, the manner of choosing electors for the Electoral College is determined by each state's legislature. Although each state designates electors by popular vote, other methods are allowed. For instance, instead of having a popular vote, a number of states used to select presidential electors by a direct vote of the state legislature itself. However, federal law does specify that all electors must be selected on the same day, which is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, i.e., a Tuesday no earlier than November 2 and no later than November 8. Today, the states and the District of Columbia each conduct their own popular elections on Election Day to help determine their respective slate of electors. Thus, the presidential election is really an amalgamation of separate and simultaneous state elections instead of a single national election run by the federal government. Like any other election in the United States, the eligibility of an individual for voting is set out in the Constitution and regulated at state level. The Constitution states that suffrage cannot be denied on grounds of race or color, sex or age for citizens 18 years or older. Beyond these basic qualifications, it is the responsibility of state legislatures to regulate voter eligibility. Generally, voters are required to vote on a ballot where they select the candidate of their choice. The presidential ballot is a vote for the electors of a candidate, meaning that the voter is not voting for the candidate, but endorsing a slate of electors pledged to vote for a specific presidential and vice presidential candidate. Many voting ballots allow a voter to blanket vote. For all candidates in a particular political party or to select individual candidates on a line-by-line -line voting system. Which candidates appear on the voting ticket is determined through a legal process known as ballot access. Usually, the size of the candidate's political party and the results of the major nomination conventions determine who is pre-listed on the presidential ballot. Thus, the presidential election ticket will not list every candidate running for president, but only those who have secured a major party nomination or whose size of their political party warrants having been formally listed. 
Laws are in effect to have other candidates pre-listed on a ticket, provided that enough voters have endorsed the candidate, usually through a signature list. The final way to be elected for president is to have one's name written in at the time of election as a write-in candidate. This is used for candidates who did not fulfill the legal requirements to be pre-listed on the voting ticket. It is also used by voters to express a distaste for the listed candidates, by writing in an alternative candidate for president such as Mickey Mouse or comedian Stephen Colbert whose application was voted down by the South Carolina Democratic Party. In any event, a write-in candidate has never won an election for president of the United States. Because U.S. territories are not represented in the Electoral College, U.S. citizens in those areas do not vote in the general election for president. Guam has held straw polls for president since the 1980 election to draw attention to this fact. Topic. Electoral College Most state laws establish a winner-take-all system, wherein the ticket that wins a plurality of votes wins all of that state's allocated electoral votes, and thus has their slate of electors chosen to vote in the Electoral College. Maine and Nebraska do not use this method, instead giving two electoral votes to the statewide winner and one electoral vote to the winner of each congressional district. Each state's winning slate of electors then meets at their respective state's capital on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December to cast their electoral votes on separate ballots for president and vice president. Although electoral college members can technically vote for anyone under the U.S. Constitution, 24 states have laws to punish faithless electors, those who do not cast their electoral votes for the person whom they have pledged to elect. In early January, the total electoral college vote count is opened by the sitting vice president, acting in his capacity as president of the Senate, and read aloud to a joint session of the incoming Congress, which was elected at the same time as the president. If no candidate receives a majority of the electoral vote at least 270, the president is determined by the rules outlined by the Twelfth Amendment. Specifically, the selection of president would then be decided by a contingent election in a ballot of the House of Representatives. For the purposes of electing the president, each state has only one vote. A ballot of the Senate is held to choose the vice president. In this ballot, each senator has one vote. The House of Representatives has chosen the victor of the presidential race only twice, in 1800 and 1824, the Senate has chosen the victor of the vice presidential race only once, in 1836. If the president is not chosen by Inauguration Day, the vice president-elect acts as president. If neither are chosen by then, Congress by law determines who shall act as president, pursuant to the 20th Amendment. Unless there are faithless electors, disputes, or other controversies, the events in December and January mentioned above are largely a formality since the winner can be determined based on the state-by-state -state popular vote results. Between the general election and Inauguration Day, this apparent winner is referred to as the president-elect, unless it is a sitting president that has won re-election. Topic. Election calendar The typical periods of the presidential election process are as follows, with the dates corresponding to the 2016 general election. Spring 2015 candidates announce their intentions to run, and, if necessary, file their statement of candidacy with the Federal Election Commission. August 2015 to March 2016 primary and caucus debates. February 1 to June 14, 2016 Primaries and Caucuses April to August, 2016 Nominating Conventions including those of the minor third parties September and October, 2016 Presidential Election Debates November 8, 2016 Election Day December 19, 2016 Electors cast their electoral votes January 6, 2017 Congress counts and certifies the electoral votes January 20, 2017 Inauguration Day Topic. Trends Topic. Previous experience Among the 44 persons who have served as president, only Donald Trump had never held a position in either government or the military prior to taking office. The only previous experience that Zachary Taylor, Ulysses S. Grant, and Dwight D. Eisenhower had was in the military. Herbert Hoover previously served as the Secretary of Commerce. 
Everyone else served in elected public office before becoming president, such as being vice president, a member of the United States Congress, or a state or territorial governor. Fourteen presidents also served as vice president. However, only John Adams 1796, Thomas Jefferson 1800, Martin Van Buren 1836, Richard Nixon 1968, and George H. W. Bush 1988 began their first term after winning an election. The remaining nine began their first term as president according to the presidential line of succession after the intraterm death or resignation of their predecessor. Of these, Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Harry S. Truman, and Lyndon B. Johnson were subsequently elected to a full term of their own, while John Tyler, Millard Fillmore, Andrew Johnson, Chester A. Arthur, and Gerald Ford were not. Ford's accession to the presidency is unique in American history in that he became vice president through the process prescribed by the 25th Amendment rather than by winning an election, thus making him the only U.S. president to not have been elected to either office. Sixteen presidents had previously served in the U.S. Senate, including four of the five who served between 1945 and 1974. However, only three were incumbent senators at the time they were elected president Warren G. Harding in 1920, John F. Kennedy in 1960, and Barack Obama in 2008. Eighteen presidents had earlier served in the House of Representatives. However, only one was a sitting representative when elected to presidency James A. Garfield in 1880. Four of the last seven presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush have been governors of a state. Geographically, these presidents were from either very large states Reagan from California, Bush from Texas or from a state south of the Mason-Dixon line and east of Texas Carter from Georgia, Clinton from Arkansas. In all, 16 presidents have been former governors, including seven who were incumbent governors at the time of their election to the presidency. The most common job experience, occupation or profession of U.S. presidents has been a lawyer. Twenty-six presidents had served as attorneys. Twenty-two presidents were also in the military. Eight presidents had served as cabinet secretaries, with five of the six presidents who served between 1801 and 1841 having held the office of U.S. Secretary of State. After leaving office, one president, William Howard Taft, served as Chief Justice of the United States. Two others later served in Congress, John Quincy Adams, who served in the House, and Andrew Johnson, who served in the Senate. Topic. Technology and media Advances in technology and media have also affected presidential campaigns. The invention of both radio and television have given way to the reliance of national political advertisements across those methods of communication. National advertisements such as Lyndon B. Johnson's 1964 commercial, Daisy, Ronald Reagan's 1984 commercial, Morning in America, and George H. W. Bush's 1988 commercial, Revolving Door, became major factors in those respective elections. In 1992, George H. W. Bush's promise of, Read My Lips, No New Taxes was extensively used in the commercials of Bill Clinton and Bush's other opponents with significant effect during the campaign. Since the development of the Internet in the mid-90s, Internet activism has also become an invaluable component of presidential campaigns, especially since 2000. The Internet was first used in the 1996 presidential elections, but primarily as a brochure for the candidate online. It was only used by a few candidates and there is no evidence of any major effect on the outcomes of that election cycle. In 2000, both candidates George W. Bush and Al Gore created, maintained and updated their campaign website. But it was not until the 2004 presidential election cycle was the potential value of the Internet seen. By the summer of 2003, ten people competing in the 2004 presidential election had developed campaign websites. Howard Dean's campaign website from that year was considered a model for all future campaign websites. His website played a significant role in his overall campaign strategy. It allowed his supporters to read about his campaign platform and provide feedback, donate, get involved with the campaign, and connect with other supporters. A Gallup poll from January 2004 revealed that 49% of Americans have used the Internet to get information about candidates, and 28% said that they use the Internet to get this information frequently. In 2008, the Internet became a grassroots and a voice of the people tool 
a way for the users to connect with each other and with the campaign, like Dean's website had done in 2004. All of the major candidates had a website and utilized social networking like Facebook and MySpace. The popularity of a candidate could be measured by the number of friends on these sites as well as on websites like Hitwise, which listed the number of hits all of the presidential candidates' websites had each week. Internet channels such as YouTube were used by candidates to share speeches and ads for free. This also served as a forum for users to attack other candidates by uploading videos of gaffes. A study done by the Pew Internet and American Life Project in conjunction with Princeton Survey Research Associates in November 2010 shows that 54% of adults in the United States used the Internet to get information about the 2010 midterm elections and about specific candidates. This represents 73% of adult Internet users. The study also showed that 22% of adult Internet users used social network sites or Twitter to get information about and discuss the elections and 26% of all adults used cell phones to learn about or participate in campaigns. E-campaigning as it has come to be called, is subject to very little regulation. On March 26, 2006, the Federal Election Commission voted unanimously to not regulate political communication on the Internet, including emails, blogs and the creating of websites. This decision made only paid political ads placed on websites subject to campaign finance limitations. A comment was made about this decision by Roger Allen Stone of Advocacy Inc. which explains this loophole in the context of a political campaign. A wealthy individual could purchase all of the email addresses for registered voters in a congressional district, produce an internet video ad, and email it along with a link to the campaign contribution page. Not only would this activity not count against any contribution limits or independent expenditure requirements, it would never even need to be reported. Topic criticisms The presidential election process is controversial controversial, with critics arguing that it is inherently undemocratic, and discourages voter participation and turnout in many areas of the country. Because of the staggered nature of the primary season, voters in Iowa, New Hampshire and other small states which traditionally hold their primaries and caucuses first in January usually have a major impact on the races. Campaign activity, media attention, and voter participation are usually higher in these states, as the candidates attempt to build momentum and generate a bandwagon effect in these early primaries. Conversely, voters in California and other large states which traditionally hold their primaries last in June usually end up having no say in who the presidential candidates will be. The races are usually over by then, and thus the campaigns, the media, and voters have little incentive to participate in these late primaries. As a result, more states vie for earlier primaries to claim a greater influence in the process. However, compressing the primary calendar in this way limits the ability of lesser-known candidates to effectively corral resources and raise their visibility among voters, especially when competing with better-known candidates who have more financial resources and the institutional backing of their party's establishment. Primary and caucus reform proposals include a national primary held on a single day, or the interregional primary plan, where states would be grouped into six regions, and each of the regions would rotate every election on who would hold their primaries first. With the primary races usually over before June, the political conventions have mostly become scripted, ceremonial affairs. As the drama has left the conventions, and complaints grown that they were scripted and dull pep rallies, public interest and viewership has fallen off. After having offered gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the major party conventions in the mid-20th century, the big three television networks now only devote approximately three hours of coverage one hour per night. Critics also argue that the Electoral College is archaic and inherently undemocratic. With all states, except Maine and Nebraska, using a winner-take-all system, both the Democratic and the Republican candidates are almost certain to win all the electoral votes from those states whose residents predominantly vote for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, respectively. This encourages presidential candidates to focus exponentially more time, money, and energy campaigning in a few so-called swing states, states in which no single candidate or party has overwhelming support. Such swing states like Ohio are inundated with campaign visits, saturation television advertising, get-out-the-vote efforts by party organizers, and debates. Meanwhile, candidates and political parties have no incentive to mount nationwide campaign efforts, or work to increase voter turnout, in predominantly Democratic Party, safe states, like California or predominantly Republican Party, safe states, like Texas. 
In practice, the winner-take-all system also both reinforces the country's two-party system and decreases the importance of third and minor political parties. Furthermore, a candidate can win the electoral vote without securing the greatest amount of the national popular vote, such as during the 1824, 1876, 1888, 2000 and 2016 elections. In theory, it is possible to secure the necessary 270 electoral votes from only the 11 most populous states and then ignore the rest of the country. Topic. Proposed changes to the election process In 1844, Representative Samuel F. Vinton of Ohio proposed an amendment to the Constitution that would replace the electoral college system with a lot system. The joint resolution called for each state to elect, by a simple majority, a presidential candidate of said state. Each state would notify Congress of the presidential election results. Congress would then inscribe the name of every state on uniform balls, equal to the number of said state's members of Congress, and deposit into a box. In a joint session of Congress, a ball would be drawn, and the elected candidate of the state of which is written on the drawn ball would be named president. A second ball would immediately be drawn after, and that state's candidate would be named vice president. The resolution did not pass the House. Representative Vinton proposed an identical amendment in 1846. Again, it was unsuccessful. The driving force behind the introduction of the resolution is unclear, as there is no recorded debate for either proposal. Other constitutional amendments, such as the Every Vote Counts Amendment, have been proposed seeking to replace the Electoral College with a direct popular vote, which proponents argue would increase turnout and participation. Other proposed reforms include the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, an interstate compact without congressional authorization, whereby individual participating states agree to allocate their electors based on the winner of the national popular vote, instead of voting their respective statewide results. Another proposal is for every state to simply adopt the district system used by Maine and Nebraska, give two electoral votes to the statewide winner and one electoral vote to the winner of each congressional district. The automatic plan would replace the electors with an automatic tallying of votes to eliminate the faithless elector affecting the outcome of the election. The proportional plan, often compared to the district plan, would distribute electoral votes in each state in proportion to the popular vote, introducing third-party effects in election outcomes. The House plan would require a constitutional amendment to allocate electors based on the House apportionment alone to lessen small state advantage. Direct election plans and bonus plans have in common a higher valuation on the popular vote for president. Topic: Electoral College results. This is a table of electoral college results. Included are candidates who received at least one electoral vote or at least 5% of the popular vote. Topic: Voter turnout. Voter turnout in the 2004 and 2008 elections showed a noticeable increase over the turnout in 1996 and 2000. Prior to 2004, voter turnout in presidential elections had been decreasing while voter registration, measured in terms of voting age population by the U.S. Census, has been increasing. The VAP figure, however, includes persons ineligible to vote, mainly non-citizens and ineligible felons, and excludes overseas eligible voters. Opinion is mixed on whether this decline was due to voter apathy, or an increase in ineligible voters on the rolls. The difference between these two measures are illustrated by analysis of turnout in the 2004 and 2008 elections. Voter turnout from the 2004 and 2008 election was, "...not statistically different," based on the voting age population used by a November 2008 U.S. Census survey of 50,000 households. If expressed in terms of vote eligible population VEP, the 2008 national turnout rate was 61.7% from 131.3 million ballots cast for president, an increase of over 1.6 percentage points over the 60.1% turnout rate of 2004, and the highest since 1968. Topic. Financial disclosures Prior to 1967, many presidential candidates disclosed assets, stock holdings, and other information which might affect the public trust. 
In that year, Republican candidate George W. Romney went a step further and released his tax returns for the previous 12 years. Since then, many presidential candidates, including all major party nominees from 1980 to 2012 have released some of their returns, although few of the major party nominees have equaled or exceeded George Romney's 12. The Tax History Project, a project directed by Joseph J. Thorndike and established of the non-profit tax analysts group, has compiled the publicly released tax returns of presidents and presidential candidates, including primary candidates. In 2016, Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump broke with tradition, becoming the only major party candidate since Gerald Ford in 1976 to not make any of his full tax returns public. Trump gave as a reason that he was being audited by the IRS. However, no law or precedent prevents a person from releasing their tax returns while under audit, and in fact President Richard M. Nixon released his tax returns while being audited. Presidential coattails Presidential elections are held on the same date as those for all the seats in the United States House of Representatives, the full terms for 33 or 34 of the 100 seats in the United States Senate, the governorships in several U.S. states, and many state and local elections. Presidential candidates tend to bring out supporters who then vote for their party's candidates for those other offices. These other candidates are said to ride on the presidential candidate's coattails. Voter turnout is also generally higher during presidential election years than either midterm election years or odd-numbered election years. Topic. Comparison with other U.S. general elections Topic. See also Outline of American politics Hashtag elections American election campaigns in the 19th century Elections in the United States First party system, Federalists versus Jeffersonian Republicans, 1790s to 1820s Second party system, Democrats versus Whigs, 1830s to 1850s Third party system, Republicans versus Democrats, 1850s to 1890s Fourth party system, Republicans versus Democrats, 1890s to 1930s Progressive era Fifth Party System, Democrats vs. Republicans, 1930s to 1960s Sixth Party System, Democrats vs. Republicans, 1960s present statistical forecasts Electoral-vote.com 538.com Polyvote 270 to an Topic. Notes Topic. Further reading Schlesinger, Arthur. Jr., ed. History of American Presidential Elections, 1789-2008-2011-3 Volume and 11 Volume Editions, Detailed Analysis of Each Election, with Primary Documents, Online v. 1789-1824, v. 2. 1824-1844, v. 3. 1848 to 1868 v 4 1872 to 1888 v 5 1892 to 1908 v 6 1912 to 1924 v 7 1928 to 1940 v 8 1944 to 1956 v 9 1960 to 1968 v 10 1972 to 1984 v 11 1988 to 2001 Topic External links The American Presidency Project UC Santa Barbara 52000 plus presidential documents Electoral College box scores Teaching about presidential elections All the maps since 1840 by counties French language site Dave Lape's Atlas of U.S. Presidential Elections History of U.S. Presidential Elections, 1789-2004 Graphic election results from 1952-2008 broken down by state Java applet. A history of the presidency from the point of view of Vermont discusses history of American presidential elections with two states as opposite. Polls. Vermont, and Alabama 
The Living Room Candidate, a compilation of presidential television ads Presidential elections, from History.com A New Nation Votes, American election returns 1787-1825 How close were presidential elections? Michael Shepard, Michigan State University Better World Links on the U.S. Presidential Election Presidential Elections, Resource Guides from the Library of Congress Presidential elections, vacancies in major party candidacies and the position of president-elect from Congressional Research Service U.S. Election Statistics, a resource guide from the Library of Congress. Electoral Votes. New International Encyclopedia, 1905. This is a tabulation of the electoral votes by election year, and also includes the results for vice president. Statistical Forecast Selection Projection 17 Poll Composite Princeton Election Consortium Gallup